Um, well, thank you guys. Um, welcome. I sorry, I've been having some te technical issues on my side. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming to this webinar. Uh, it is a part of a series we're doing in uh, joint with the impact facility on golden myths, um, which is on ASM mining. So ASM mining is a livelihood option for that supports more than 100 million people across the world. And we are really excited to be doing this. I just would like to note a few housekeeping items before we start, uh, which is for presenters to please stay on mute um, while we are, each other are speaking. And for our participants, if you have questions, um, we have activated the Q and A option on this, um, and we'll be following the questions throughout the um, webinar and putting them together so that we can have a Q and A session at the end. We'll be going through three presenters who will have 10 minutes each, and then we'll open it up for everyone. Um, if you have any comments as people are talking, please, you can write those in the, uh, the chat box uh, in case anyone wants to give, um, a, you know, make a note in agreement or uh, com comment on what someone is saying. Um, so we're really excited to be doing this. I personally um, am, let's see. So this uh, webinar series is particularly on empowering women in ASM gold mining from changing the norms to fostering commitment across supply chain. I think this for me is really exciting. Um, I am the director of Solidaridad in North America. And when I took this role, I didn't know a lot about ASM mining, but a passion for me personally was uh, gender empowerment. So I think this is really exciting. At Solidaridad, one of the reasons why we focus on ASM mining, as I said, is that the sector itself supports more than 100 million people and directly employs 40 million people across the globe. Um, women account for about half of this, and a large amount of this work is informal. Because of the nature of this, women are often um, subjected to more of the dangerous or lower paying practices, making gender equity within the sector a really important um, discussion to be having. Within Solidaridad, uh, gender is uh, really crucial and core to everything we do. Uh, it's very well evidenced that investing in women trickles through to the household level. Women are more likely to spend money on their children's education, on healthcare, on nutritious foods. Uh, investing in women, it means investing in mothers and mothers will invest in healthy choices for their kids. We have a three-tiered view at Solidaridad as to how we look at gender and how the value that we place on investing in the gender business case. Um, one of which is working for gender equity within human capital. So really striving to push for equal employment and equal opportunity between men and women. Um, another is empowering the voices. Of, of women. So within households, within companies, uh, working to make sure that the voices and the opinions of win women are, are heard. And this, you know, has the opportunity to trickle through towards um, just supporting those discussions on how we can spend money in a more equitable way, both from the household level all the way up to the company level. And third is what I mentioned it, mentioned um, previous, which is just the, the fact that women specifically invest money differently. So Solidaridad truly uh, is strongly is working for more um, sustainable, socially, economically, and environmentally viable supply chains. Women, when money gets into the hands of women, they are more likely to spend um, and make choices that support um, more socially and environmentally practices, environmentally friendly practices. So we work to truly do this within everything we do. And um, 
particularly within mining, given the informalness of the sector and um, the, the, the opportunity that it has to lift so many people globally out of poverty. This is a discussion that we really feel should be top of mind. Um, in doing so, this provides um, an opportunity for, for women to participate in the sector and to truly push globally um, for ASM to be viewed uh, as, as a, not as a negative field, but as a way that people and women specifically can participate and truly lift themselves up. So we're really excited about having this webinar today. We have three great speakers for you, um, all of which work within the intersection of gender and ASM mining and um, our close partners of Solidaridad. So we have Marlene Lilliveld, who is the program manager at Samavi. She is going to speak about a program that we work closely on with her um, called The Golden Line, which is uh, really exciting for us. Um, then we have Elizabeth Ekavaria, who is our mining program coordinator at Solidaridad in Colombia. And then we have Katrine Danielson, who's the senior gender advisor at KIT and one of the founding members of Women Rights and Mining. Um, so we're very excited to get started today. As I said, um, please use the Q&A function if you have questions. We'll be tracking these throughout and we'll be having a Q&A session towards the end. And then um, feel free to comment or give kudos and cheers to our speakers as they are going uh, using the, the chat function. So Marlene, over to you. Okay, thanks Rebecca and hello everyone. In my presentation, I would like to share the approach and the uh, experiences of the Call the Line program in empowering women and addressing gender-based violence in artisanal and small-scale cold mining communities. Next slide, please. Uh, women in ASM communities face discrimination at multiple levels due to discriminatory and patriarchal social cultural norms. Women are restricted in the type of work they can do and women often earn less than men doing the same work. Women also lack access to skills, land and capital. And on top of doing paid work, women are responsible for taking care of the children and the household. In addition, women face gender-based violence and lack access to healthcare, contraception and sexual and reproductive health and rights education. Next slide, please. The Call on the Line program is an initiative of CIMAVI, Solidaridad and Healthy Entrepreneurs and is funded by the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The five years program started in 2016 and aims to empower women living in artisanal and small scale cold mining communities in Ghana and Tanzania. We work at multiple levels. We work in the mines, in the surrounding mining communities, at policy level and at the level of the supply chain. Next slide, please. To empower women and address GBV, we use the EAST and EMAP methodologies. EAST stands for Economic and Social Empowerment, and EMAP stands for Engaging Men in Accountable Practice. The uh, methodologies are originally developed by the IRC for use in humanitarian settings, and they were proven effective in research. CIMAVI has adapted the methodologies for use in ASM communities. Next slide, please. The EAST methodology takes about one year to complete and uh, is comprised of three stages. In the first stage, we bring women together in groups and establish village saving and loans associations. Um, women are uh, meeting on a weekly basis and they build a social support network and gain access to savings, loans and an emergency fund. After these groups have been running for several months and the trust has been built among the women in the groups, we start with the second stage, a gender discussion series. And for this, uh, the women also invite their male partners. Um, and if they don't have a male partner, another male household member. 
together they uh, participate in a series of exercises on uh, household financial decision making, uh, the value of women in the household and uh, conflict resolution. And this has the aim to increase women's participation in household financial decision making and to address gender inequality at household level. At the third stage, um, we provide women with a business skills training so that they can make the most of their savings in the VSLAs. And we support women to uh, develop and implement a basic business plan. Next slide, please. After we completed EASE, we uh, start with EMAP, which takes about six months to implement. And the aim of EMAP is to engage influential men in the communities as agents of change to address gender-based violence. The EMAP is uh, comprised of two stages. We start with uh, working with the women in the VSLAs and um, we provide them with knowledge on violence against women and girls. And we also fac facilitate a discussion on their hopes and priorities for change. In the second stage, we form groups of influential men in the communities, for instance, community leaders or religious leaders. And we facilitate a discussion series on gender-based violence and uh, gender inequality. And um, the issues that came out of the discussions in the women's groups are incorporated in the curriculum for the men to ensure that the discussions in the men's groups center around the priorities of the women. Next slide, please. Uh, in the corner line, we are complementing EASE and EMAP with several other activities. Um, and I would like to highlight that we are uh, training a group of women who are linked to the VSLAs uh, as so-called women ambassadors or advocates. And we are supporting them to bring issues that come out of the discussions in the VSLAs to the attention of local community and government leaders. Um, in the minds, we have established grievance mechanisms and have appointed female confidential counselors so that women can report cases of violence. And we have furthermore also built the capacity of the police, health workers and uh, local committees in the communities to support women um, who have experienced violence. Next slide, please. Um, for so far, we have uh, established uh, 200 uh, women's groups with uh, 4,500 uh, female members and more than 1,000 men have participated in the gender discussions. In 2019, we have conducted a uh, midterm evaluation and uh, the women who participated in the survey indicated to see more opportunities for earning money. And a large proportion of the women um, also reported, reported increased access to credit and to have increased financial security. And they also experienced an increase in joint decision making on financial matters in their households. The midterm evaluation also showed indications of increased support of um, uh, for gender equality in the communities. And this is, for instance, uh, reflected by an increased percentage of men who accept women to decide on spacing between children. In the mines, we have seen women taking up different positions and women in the mines also reported more respect for women in the mines. Next slide, please. Of course, we also experienced challenges and we learned a lot about what works well and what doesn't work so well. For instance, at the start of the program, we experienced that it took much more time as expected to build the trust of women to participate in the VSLAs and to take loans. And this was because uh, stories about uh, negative experiences with credit providers and VSLAs. For instance, stories about money being stolen or um, people being arrested by the police for not being able to pay back their loans. We also experienced that it is not easy to mobilize men to join gender discussions. Um, but what worked well for us is to start with a motivated smaller group of men who subsequently motivate other men to join, so to make the groups slowly grow. 
the midterm evaluation indicated that a large proportion of women uh, experienced an increase in financial security. However, the uh, perceived increase was still relatively small. And therefore we learned that it is important to link the VSLAs to um, larger loan opportunities from the local government and from financial institutions. And we have furthermore also increased our focus on vocational skills training for women to provide them with uh, additional economic opportunities. What we also learned is that um, sharing experience between the women's groups works well. Especially sharing successes of some women groups motivated and inspired other women groups to take initiatives. And what worked well in Ghana was the creation of platforms that uh, bring together leaders of the VSLAs, women ambassadors and other key stakeholders in the communities, such as queen mothers, uh, local leaders and government officers. Um, through this platform, uh, we facilitated uh, increased women's participation at processes at community level. Next slide, please. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Uh, for more information, you could visit the website of the Golden Line program or send us an email. Great, thank you so much, Marlene. And we've had quite a few questions come up for you, so we can look into these at the end. Um, next up, we have Elizabeth, uh, who is from Solidaridad in Colombia. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks to Solidaridad for organizing this uh, webinar series. I would like to talk to you about uh, how to empower women that work in ASM from an approach of uh, initiatives that aim to change the structures, the structures in which women that, uh, that work in ASM live and develop their uh, everyday lives. So I would like to say very briefly first something that Rebecca already said, and is that no development policy is complete without a gender focus, since it has been demonstrated that when companies, communities, uh, governments, and uh, communities, again, uh, have programs that promote women empowerment and provide environments in which women can thrive, they also see improvements in indicators of productivity, inclusion, and otherwise. So not only is it just unfair to promote gender equality and women empowerment, but it is also definitely good business. Next slide, please. Uh, in this brief presentation, I would like to first go through a few data on how it is to be a women minor in ASM in Latin America. And so this is what I'm gonna do now. After that, I will go through a couple of initiatives that I think are good examples of how to intervene in the ASM environment uh, policy, uh, policies and uh, general uh, context. So we can actually promote women empowerment. And at the end, I will give just a few recommendations uh, how to move further. So first of all, uh, this data uh, is from uh, a couple of baselines uh, developed by Solidaridad and other uh, civil society organizations in Latin America. We can see uh, as artisanal and small scale mining is mostly a poverty driven activity. Well, women that work in this uh, business are exposed to many challenging situations. They are mostly middle aged women that are the sole providers and the sole breadwinners of their households. They have very few years or no years at all of formal education or training, and they have a huge representation of persons that are from African descendants and that are also indigenous. Because of this uh, context, they usually receive very low wages that are sometimes even below the minimum wages of their countries, and they are they usually have very uh, restricted access to key resources such as lands, permits, information, loans, and so on and so on. Uh, next slide, please. So now, having that context in mind, I would like to talk first about an initiative from the policy uh, field, and it's uh, 
back a few years ago in Latin America, and I know this happens uh, in other parts of the world, artisanal miners uh, were in a very gray area in their legal rights to operate and to trade their gold. So this changed very recently in Colombia and Peru, when both countries made changes to their mining codes and actually uh, provided a space for artisanal miners, which in some regions, 50% of more are women, so they could actually be legal uh, through a registry that allowed them to trade without being prosecuted for being carrying out their activity. This has been very important for women in Latin America uh, because it made them visible. However, this change in the legal environment and in the legal context, however, created some additional barriers. The main one is that this uh, new registry establishes very restrictive quotas for how much gold or associated minerals you can actually sell. So this has made uh, that women and men working as artisanal miners in river basins or uh, selecting waste rock uh, cannot access uh, an, an income that allows them to, uh, to overcome the poverty cycle. Uh, next slide, please. Another initiative that I would like to share with you is uh, the establishment and support of networks of women miners. Two cases I have in mind, which are uh, one in Colombia called Women of Gold and another one in Bolivia, which is called the Women and Mining Network, uh, which is part of the project Corazoma, which means good gold in Aymara. Uh, these two initiatives have like a couple of years of being active. Actually, the network in Bolivia has been active for more than 20 years, but recently started receiving the support of Solidaridad. And what this has been doing is that it's providing women access to spaces for networking, spaces to receive training and to participate in workshops that improve their capacities to be leaders in their communities. And they have also have had the chance to identify issues that are key for them to be addressed by their local authorities or national authorities. So for example, women in Bolivia have made a case about how important it is for them to provide running water for their communities, to combat gender-based violence, and to gain tools to become leaders. Uh, in Colombia, we've seen results of these networks uh, so far, for example, in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, these women networks have proved to be effective in making women to more close knit so they can actually uh, present their case against before the authorities and access resources such as humanitarian aid and groceries and like call the attention of the communities and the society that they exist and they have uh, particular needs as women and as minors. This, uh, this approach can also move forward into the construction of legal figures such as cooperatives or associations uh, through which women could access international markets, uh, begin to get close to the compliance with international standards, uh, like has been happening with a few cases in Colombia. Um, next slide, please. And well, from that, from those two experiences that I shared with you, I still want to share a few further recommendations about how to keep moving forward with the gender agenda in uh, artisanal and small scale gold mining. Uh, like I said, it is really important to promote the, that uh, lands and permits for mining are available and accessible to women. So it's important to move forward with those legal changes and providing the tools so that women can actually uh, apply to these permits and these authorizations. It is important to uh, provide women with access to financial resources and access to the financial sector. This is, this is a huge barrier in the sector. It's important that they can access technical resources and other types of information, that their uh, networks are strengthened and accompanied in becoming stronger and creating strong uh, female leaderships. And it's important that we, uh, that we, the corporation, the governments, and the private sector can provide spaces and platforms for dialogue that are open to women. Before I finish, I would like to say that also, as an, uh, a good example of how to support women 
in practical terms, right now there is a fundraising campaign going on from our colleagues in Peru that are looking forward to raise some resources so we can support women that work as payaqueras, which means they select waste rock material uh, and they get uh, valuable gold from that. And they are having a lot of difficulties right now in the midst of this crisis. So I understand that after the webinar is over, you will be uh, shared with a link to this fundraising campaign, or you can definitely contact me about that. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, if anyone has any questions for Elizabeth on what she's presented, please um, feel free to share them in the Q&A box and we can get to them at the end. Um, oh, and we, uh, someone did ask if we'll be sharing this presentation and Elizabeth mentioned sending her an email and I just skipped over that slide, but we will share this with everyone uh, when we're done. So um, next is Katrine Danielson. Hello everybody. And um, first of all, thank you to Solidaridad for inviting me to be part of this um, webinar. Uh, my presentation is about the Women's Rights and Mining Initiative. I want to tell you a little bit about the background, how did it come about, and what is it that we are doing, and um, not at least what our call for action is uh, in, in this current time. Next slide, please. So, Women's Rights and Mining it's a collaborative effort of a number of different actors, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is leading uh, the initiative, a number of civil society organizations in the Netherlands, including Action Aid, Timavi Solidaridad. Um, there's also a couple of uh, international NGOs, including Impact in, in Canada and the Alliance of Responsible Mining, as well as, as KIT, a knowledge institute in Amsterdam. Um, so, um, Women's rights and mining has been active since the beginning of 2017. And what we really want to do is to secure commitment and action amongst different uh, stakeholders, both the governments, private sector and, uh, and civil society to support women's rights in mining and mineral supply chain. Um, I think everybody knows, everybody who's here might know that gender and mining concerns uh, that, that what we know about gender mining concerns, it's, it's increasingly very well documented. And actually, in fact, I think we can, we can say that the knowledge uh, on these concerns and initiatives such as the, the, the Golden Line project, uh, we've seen more and more of such initiatives uh, um, over the last couple of years. Um, what Women's Rights and Mining set out to do is to ensure that this knowledge also gets discussed and becomes a serious theme of attention in the mainstream of the mining sector. Um, women's rights and mining works across the mining sector, meaning that we work also with large scale mining, so not only uh, ASM, but we have done quite a lot of work on ASM, not at least through the work that we have been doing together with the OECD um, Secretariat in connection to the Forum on Responsible Mining Supply Chains. So I'll, 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 I'll focus a little bit on that in my presentation. Um, so a bit of background, the women's rights and mining journey began actually back in 2016 when the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, asked for uh, research done through the gender research facility to support a particular project in the Great Great Lakes region, scaling up mineral traceability project. And um, this research, besides robust evidence on the gender dimensions of, of mining, it was ASM mining, it also re re revealed that at that time, there's very little knowledge about who's actually doing what on gender and mining. So a logical step of the ministry at that time was to get a mapping done on all actors that are working strategically on gender and mining in the Netherlands and also internationally, and to organize a sharing and learning event to bring all actors together. And based on that event, it became quite clear that again at that time, there was actually no real vehicle, uh, no real uh, collective uh, that, um, could disseminate uh, knowledge on the gender dimension of, of mining and uh, influence policy on the basis of that knowledge. And so the Women's Rights and Mining Initiative was born. Um, next slide, please. 
We are uh, working in three broad areas. We are working to establish a better understanding of uh, the gender dimensions of, of mining and mineral supply chain and to create awareness and also to secure commitment to take action to support women's rights. So I'll go through each of these work areas one by one. In terms of understanding, uh, we are supporting the development of a number of knowledge products and tools uh, to strengthen um, gender risk mitigation strategies uh, and address gender concerns in mineral production. Just to mention a few, um, at, uh, last year we uh, published and, and launched the Interclear on Gender and Mining, which is a joint publication of the uh, Women's Right and Mining and GIZ, and it was launched at last year's OECD Forum on Responsible Mineral Supply Chain. Uh, another, in also let's say almost we call almost our bestseller is the so-called 10 Do's Guide on uh, Mitigating Gender Risks During OECD Due Diligence Implementation. It provides 10 very concrete recommendations uh, on how uh, both uh, companies and governments and practitioners can ensure that gender concerns are taken into account in due diligence. We are also doing films. Uh, and all of this uh, you can find on our Women's Rights and Mining website. There's a link provided here in the presentation. Um, we have the ambition that the website will become a, the repository of uh, knowledge on, um, on, on gender and, and mining and mineral concerns, mineral supply concerns. So, so please do share if you have any uh, uh, information. We also uh, uh, do knowledge platform sessions such as webinars of, of, uh, like, like this, where we bring together uh, different um, uh, knowledge experts, different practitioners to tell about the, the latest and, and, uh, the latest uh, experiences, the latest insights, uh, and basically everybody's welcome to join these knowledge platform sessions. Uh, next, please. So to create awareness about uh, women's rights in mining, um, what we're doing, we are organizing gender sessions at international uh, uh, mining and mineral supply um, conferences and events. And this is really to ensure that there's also in the mainstream of, of the sector that there's dedicated discussion on, on these important issues. Um, what we've seen is that over the years since we started, um, uh, we have had uh, some, uh, uh, um, let's say, influence on how uh, these concerns are discussed. For example, the OECD Forum for Responsible Minimal Supply Chain, which is a yearly uh, event. Um, uh, in four years ago, uh, when we uh, worked for the first time with the OECD um, Secretariat to organize a gender session, it was kind of a side session at the event. Um, and we focus very much about awareness. Uh, so these are issues that you should really take serious. Um, the next year, uh, we were able to focus much more on practical tools, especially for the private sector. Most of the participants in, in that conference are private sector companies for tackling gender risks. And we were presenting a, a, a good practices and uh, explaining how uh, different actors also private sector have been going about and have been achieving uh, positive results. Last year, uh, we were able to mobilize uh, a big group of uh, participants to support a call to action for supporting women's uh, rights, something I'll come back to in a moment. Um, I think I will not talk about the intergovernmental forum on mining, but that's another forum where we've had, had quite some success in getting um, gender concerns into the mainstream of sessions that normally would have been gender blind. Next, please. We are also um, trying to create commitment um, to take action for women's rights. Uh, and we do that in various ways. Uh, one I want to mention is that we are, whenever possible, providing comments to international policies, standards, policy, um, position papers, or other instruments, so that we can increase the gender responsive, responsiveness in mining policy. Over the years, I think we've done so in more than 10 cases. And um, a couple of examples of, of real the policy influence also um, related to ASM is that we were able to have uh, the OSD risk portal um, uh, include uh, 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 more than the recommendations, almost a requirement for ensuring that there's also 
uh, data collected on uh, uh, violence against women through the UN, UN Women's um, Global Database on Violence Against Women. Um, moving on, um, last but not least, uh, Women's Rights and Mining has taken initiative uh, for a call for action together with the OECD's uh, Secretariat, the so-called stakeholder statement on implementing gender responsive due diligence and ensuring the human rights of women in mineral supply chains. Um, this was prepared together with the OECD Secretariat and it include, includes 13 concrete commitments on how different actors, so states, private sector and civil society, can work together to prevent gender inequalities in the supply chain. Uh, so I said there are 13 commitments, but to, to mention some of the really important ones, it, co it calls on stakeholders to acknowledge that gender norms and unequal power relations are embedded in both market and state institutions, and in, in calls for actors to uh, facilitate uh, that these are being addressed. It also uh, um, urges private sector actors to implement gender responsive due diligence in mineral supply chains. And here, obviously, we have the Tendu guide to, uh, um, to support private sector actors to do so. And um, a third commitment that we uh, promote is uh, that private sector in particular should develop and improve existing gender policies in consultation with women, as that is not often done. Um, and what's also important that they should be, the policies should be supported by dedicated resources, accountability mechanisms, and processes to ensure transparency with stakeholders. Um, the statement, yeah, I guess you could say it's based on the spirit of inclusive partnerships, in that we believe that each sector, so I mean government, the private sector, and civil society have a unique role to play uh, to ensure that women's rights are realized in, in, in mining sector and mineral supply chains. Uh, no one sector can, can, can attain this ambition alone. Um, we are really uh, pleased to be able to tell you that 34 organizations have since last year signed on to the statement. You can find all 34 of them uh, mentioned uh, on our uh, Women's Rights and Mining website. And uh, please visit the site you can sign up there as well. Uh, next slide, please. This is, of course, very encouraging, and uh, it supports our hope that, um, that this statement will become a, an instrument uh, so that we can uh, further uh, enhance the commitment to take action. Um, we also hope that we can use it to, to learn from each other. And actually, um, we do intend to uh, administer a yearly survey to ask signatories, what have you been doing? How, how are you uh, uh, progressing on the commitments? What are concrete uh, examples? Um, do you have solutions uh, that you want to share with others? The first of these surveys, it was delayed due to COVID-19, um, but we expect to be uh, able to um, to send it out and, and collect data very soon and uh, report back in another se session. So stay tuned. Uh, we will, uh, we will uh, uh, if you stay, if you uh, check out our website regularly, you will be, uh, you'll be able to see uh, when we will be able to report on that or uh, the results of the survey. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, there's not so much less than to thank you for uh, listening and uh, also encouraging you to support and uh, our statement and spread the word about the gender statement uh, to other relevant stakeholders in your network. Um, as again, here is the link to the website. And if you have any questions, you're most welcome to send me an email. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katrina. Um, it's really great to learn about the work that uh, women rights and mining is doing. Okay, so we have quite a few questions that have come in. Um, I wanted to start with one that was a, initially addressed to Elizabeth and Marlene. Um, it came in before your presentation, Katrine, but I think you might also have something to add, um, particularly about project design. So when you guys are designing projects within ASM, um, it's been noted that it's ASM mining has a cultural setup that's extremely rooted in patriarchy. 
where do you guys start in what do you believe is the most effective way to power, empower women and where do you start in the project design process to make sure that they're included? Uh, sh shall I? Um, yeah, what, I guess, I you can start, yeah, I think it is very important to start with investing, uh, with building uh, very strong relationships with uh, community leaders, uh, mine management, um, religious leaders, and the local government. Um, and um, in the Golden Line, we, we have really spent uh, a lot of effort on that, and that really uh, paid off because they helped a lot in. Um, in yeah, acquiring support from other community members for our activities. And um, we also started first with uh, setting up uh, the village saving and loans associations. Um, and that created uh, a lot of uh, trust. Um, and uh, after a few months, uh, we started with slowly um, discussing uh, gender. Uh, so it's a, a process. Uh, Elizabeth or Katrine, do you guys have anything to add to that? Yeah, Elizabeth. I would like to say, uh, I think a very important step, even before you start uh, implementing the project is to make a very good gender focused baseline, because like that you can know where are the biggest uh, resistances in the, in the field. So what are the biggest concerns? What are the biggest inequalities or gaps with the, between women and men? So it's very important to know who's doing what, who's having access to what, why women do, do not have access to this information or, or these resources. So I think that's really important. And during that baseline uh, exercise, you can also build these very important relationships that Marlene was talking about. So I think that's a very good and important step in making uh, projects and designing projects that actually can help us fix these gender inequalities in ASM. Yeah, and maybe I can can add that, um, and and it builds on um, my line's uh, presentation that what's incredibly important is that we also take time to um, to uh, work with uh, both staff and project participants to have them give them a safe space to really reflect on their own biases and own uh, uh, norms um, and ensure that we start with with the personal uh, very often uh, in earlier days you also you had a lot of projects working on gender equality issues without actually really uh, let's say, um, acknowledging that uh, these issues also permeate the project structures themselves and project staff themselves. So I think that that's also in incredibly important, self-reflection uh, of, of, of project and organizations. Great, thank you. Um, Marlene, you also mentioned um, VSLAs in your answer as one of the ways you've been able to successfully engage in the community. And we did have uh, specific question come up to VSLAs and also with access to finance. So um, let me switch over to there. Uh, someone had asked if you, through the VSLAs, are you enabling women to transition into safer, more sustainable livelihoods? Um, and how uh, you're kind of elaborating a little bit more on how you're using the VSLA to, as a real entry point to the community. Yes, we uh, established uh, the VSLAs both uh, in the mines and in the mining communities. And um, we actually leave it up to the women themselves to decide what kind of business they would like to strengthen or, or, uh, or start. So we have seen that, um, that women started different types of businesses depending on their own um, choice. Uh, we saw women starting businesses in selling pancakes or uh, renting out chairs for events, uh, but also uh, women um, starting a business in grinding ore or selling uh, personal protective equipment uh, in mines. So it, it totally depends on uh, what women um, decided themselves uh, to focus on. And uh, yeah, sometimes um, women also started a, a group business uh, uh, with the whole VSLA. Um, and um, 
we uh, are trying to link them to loan opportunities also from the local government. And uh, we were successful in a few cases. Um, and then women obtained a larger loan, uh, which really helped to further make their business grow. Great, thank you. I think that's such a great point to make about the ultimate goal also being um, supporting women to have agency over their own income versus making the decision of you know what may seem like the smartest way to spend it for them. Um, Elizabeth, just to move on to you, um, someone had asked if you could elaborate more on your approach to supporting women minors in um, Latin America with access to finance, and if you have any examples of how you've been able to support women in remote areas uh, where financial infrastructure is uh, not, not very prevalent. Okay, so in that matter, there is still a lot of work to do. In Latin America, the mining sector in general and ASM, particularly women in ASM, have, uh, have been having a hard time accessing financial services, even accessing the opportunity to have a savings account. It's a, a challenge for them as the financial sector is really, um, is really concerned about the risks about mining in, in conflict affected areas. So uh, but I've been involved in a few initiatives trying to reach to the financial sector because we've, what we've seen is that there is a lot of um, misconceptions and going back to the, the, the motivation for this series webinars, there are a lot of myths around what ASM and small mining is like. So when you go to a bank and you try to throw up an account as a miner, well, what, you, what you face is a wall. So we've seen that there's a lot of work to do in that way, but I've seen that nowadays with this FinTech applications and innovations, there has been uh, a new path opening to offer financial sectors in very remote areas. For example, I've, I've been aware that uh, there are a few initiatives in Latin America to provide uh, savings accounts for now uh, through uh, smartphones and even uh, phones that are, aren't even smart, like the old phones that only receive text messages. So this is a very good step forward because it allows people that live in very remote areas and have not access to the internet, for example, that they can actually manage uh, savings accounts so they can receive their payments. And as an anecdotal experience, I've been noticing that men and women behave differently facing these opportunities. Like men usually lose their phones more usually, so they lose access to their accounts, and women are a little bit more uh, more serious about keeping these uh, phone numbers with them and not losing their access to their accounts. We still have a lot to do to provide, for example, loans in Colombia and Latin America. We still haven't got to that, but we're trying to provide them at least with the basic access to financial access. But I think it's a long way to go still. Sorry, I was stuck on mute there for a second. Um, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, we had a question that came in on market access. Um, so in terms of market access, how effective have women been able to engage directly with the market without interference from brokers? Um, Marlene, maybe you can comment about how this has worked out with the golden line. Um, Katrine, I don't know if you have any perspectives on this in terms of gender, gender sensitive due diligence. Um, and Elizabeth, if you have any uh, thoughts from Latin America specifically, feel free to also jump in. Um, yeah, in the golden line, um, yeah, we also uh, are working on the supply chain um, and um, yeah, we are engaging uh, market players to increase the demand for uh, responsible and um, responsible gold with respect to um, women's uh, rights. Um, yeah, I think my colleagues uh, from Solidaridad could uh, better answer this question. Elizabeth, do you want Sorry. to take a stab at that? Can you please repeat the question? I lose that question for a bit, sorry. 
Yeah, the question was that about market access and if um, our programs have specifically managed to directly link women to the market uh, versus having them have to go through brokers. Okay, so I understand that some of uh, Solidaridad projects, for example, in Peru, that work directly with minors uh, on the field are working towards making uh, direct links between the miners in the field and the buyers in the international market. I know this has been done through our uh, uh, through formalizations, through coexistent relationships between small scale miners and the industrial sector. So we've been having a very close relationship being formed between women and men that work in mining and um, new and large scale mining operations. Like to, that would like to improve their relationship with the community so they can they provide support technical assistance so that these small operations or individuals can actually gather their production and reach to international markets through uh, certification initiatives and for example through the uh, compliance with international regulations such as the OECD guidelines. So yeah, we've been working through that and uh, like you, you said, Rebecca, uh, all of the Solidaridad interventions have a very strong gender focus. So women that are part of these initiatives are also being uh, included meaningfully. Great, thank you. Katrine, did you have anything to add on that question? Yes, that we have um, at, at the OST forum uh, at the second year, we had tried to uh, bring to the attention of, of the, the audience there uh, the constraints that women minors face. And we had given some examples of some, some private actors who are making an effort to overcome that particular uh, issue. But what we also recognize is that there's still a lot to be done. It's often really on a project basis or particular private sector companies who are making an effort. There is really not a concerted effort to, to, to do so. Um. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, we've had a few questions come in specific to location. Um, I think the countries that have been brought up are Mongolia, Philippines, and Zambia. Um, I just wanted to note that Solidaridad specifically is active in South America, in Peru, Bolivia, and Colombia, and Africa in Ghana, Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya. Um, we're not specifically working uh, in Zambia or the countries in, in Asia that have been mentioned as well. Um, but I thought maybe, Katrine, maybe you could discuss ways that um, some uh, met people who are interested from Asia can get more involved with the Women Rights and Mining platform, if that's of interest, or if you have any members there. No, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so uh, as I said, there's a there's a core group that 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 sort of uh, steers and uh, steers the women's rights and mining. But we also do have a, a knowledge platform, and everybody's uh, welcome to join. All you need to do is to send an email uh, to uh, to uh, info at women's rights and mining. You can find that information on our website. But I would also uh, encourage you to, to, to look at our website to see what, uh, there are resources that are not only Africa focused, but also either global and I believe also studies that are particularly focused on, on Asia. So, so do have a look and I, I hope you'll find something that can inspire, inspire and support you. Great, thank you for clarifying. Um, we are coming up to the end, but um, we did have a few questions that came in and I wanted to just touch base on them on the replicability of the tools that we're using, um, both within Golden Line and generally, I think across, um, Katrine, you mentioned some tools as well. Um, how are how available are they for use and, and how replicable are they? And specifically, we also had a question, Marlene, about the economic, social, and empowerment method um, about uh, have you faced any opposition from in influential men while implementing this? Yes, uh, now we are happy to share our uh, methodologies. Uh, so feel free to contact me and uh, I can share the, the manuals of EASE and EMAP. 
Um, we didn't face large uh, opposition of um, community leaders, but I think this was also because we invested a lot in, in building um, relationships. Um, but we do notice that there is still uh, a lack of trust um, sometimes uh, in the communities and uh, within households. Um, women are, for instance, sometimes secretly participating in the PSLAs and um, uh, hiding their, uh, yeah, their savings uh, from, their, um, yeah, from their male partners. Um, yeah, so there's still uh, a lot of work to be done there. But um, yeah, I am not aware of, of uh, that, that we faced a lot of um, opposition from community leaders. Um, what I want to say about tools is that I believe that it's important that in, in each particular socioeconomic cultural context that tools are uh, contextualized. Um, I think that is a good development practice. Uh, so that's that's one thing. At the same time, also, there is a lot of tools out there, uh, both tools such as, as, as the really uh, very interesting one that my line has been talking about, but also tools to support uh, uh, assessments of, of gender impact in, in mining or tools that help to uh, address sexual and gender based violence in mining. Um, there's a lot out there. Um, uh, so I there's not a lack of tools. Uh, I think, uh, again, um, for those who have a particular um, um, issue in mind, look at our website. Hopefully you can find something and do contextualize it. Mm. Great. So we're, you know, a minute over right now. So I just wanted to do one last question and then we can kind of wrap up. Um, if I, I understand some people might have to drop off, but as we said, we'll be sending the recording of this out. Um, which has been particularly about creating links between um, within the programs that we've discussed today, both with um, to larger mines as well as to um, gold and jewelry suppliers, and how um, how the projects are addressing this, or how uh, the panelists feel we can create these links. I could share uh, an experience on that, and it's uh, I've known of a project taking place in Peru in which uh, jewelers that are customers of uh, Fermine Gold, for example, or other types of certified gold, have provided training on jewelry design to women that are part of mining communities. So I think this is a very interesting way in which we can uh, promote the women empowerment and their economic autonomy if we provide them with activities that may be um, linked to the uh, mining supply chain. So I think this is a good way to do it. I would like just to share that that little bit of uh, experience that comes to mind. But I think there are a lot of ways in which the private sector can get involved through buying the gold, providing training, or providing tools so that women can uh, improve their practices. Great. Um, Marlene or Katrine, did you have anything you wanted to add to this before we wrap up? Okay, so I just wanted to note that um, we do have another webinar coming up about um, deep diving into supply chains and responsible uh, ASM gold and access to finance. Um, this will be in September and November, so please keep an eye out. Um, also, uh, we have links within this presentation to the previous webinars in this series. So when everyone receives uh, the presentation, feel free to go back and, and view the um, slide decks and the recordings that uh, have previously occurred. And we've also included two slides that has the links to any sources that our um, panelists presented. So thank you. I wanted to say thank you to the panelists specifically for your time and sharing um, your knowledge with us. And for everyone, thank you so much for the great questions. I wish we had more time to get through the remaining ones. But um, what we can do as well as any questions that didn't get answered, we can try to address them in the email with the presentation that goes out. 
Um, so thank you to everyone and uh, it, was, it was great to connect. Bye everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye everyone.